Spoilers for Blue Beetle. Not long ago, the YouTube channel Nerd Rotic Daily uploaded a video titled Let's Taco About Blue Beetle, whose thumbnail you're seeing now. That's Jola Maradueña as Jaime Reyes, alongside Consuela from Family Guy, a taco or, you know, a chalupa, and a big capitalized yikes. People didn't like that video very much. Beetle, and they are so honestly, blatantly racist. Just look at this fuck ass thumbnail. Look at it, okay? This guy straight up called us sneaky? Nah, this isn't criticism of a movie. This is hating on us as a people. This is just so blatant. Oh my goodness, bro. I so let's talk about Nerdrotic, shall we? Nerdrotic is the channel and persona of this guy, Gary. If you've spent much time on the comic book or superhero movie side of YouTube, or if you've seen many videos on this platform pushing back against wokeness, the message, or Disney's quest to undermine masculinity or whatever, you'll be familiar with Nerdrotic, or at least you'll have seen his influence. Nerdrotic's content tends to fall into one of two categories. His main channel output is this stuff. Videos which recap the commercial performance and critical reception of recent popular films and shows, sometimes accurately, sometimes less so, primarily in order to build, maintain, and monetize those above anti-woke narratives. His other main impact lies with the podcast he runs, Friday Night Tights, which gathers together the Avengers of YouTube media literacy on a weekly basis, a roster ranging from your garden variety blatant bigots to nitpickers and negativity mills, still informed by an opposition to Hollywood's wokeness to the message, but less obviously. The taco video is from this latter category, an edited down segment of these titans of intellect discussing DC's recent Blue Beetle film. But why did this happen? Why is the comment section under that video filled with revulsion, rather than the typical cheerleading? Why did this video have that wider impact, and what can that tell us about Nerdrotic's role in the reactionary content ecosystem? Again, let's talk about it, shall we? The first thing to talk about should probably be the first thing you see with this video, the thumbnail. So, the thumbnail. It's bad. Is it outright racist, or is it just crude and insensitive? Well, the overall judgment's not really my call to make, but what I can do is break down what's wrong with it. Here's the thing. Sometimes, stereotypes don't come from nowhere. Especially, you know, cuisine-related ones. I'm British. I drink a lot of tea. I love a full English every now and then. A lot of Parisians buy baguettes and drink wine. A lot of Germans like currywurst or kebabs. A lot of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans eat tacos. Does every single aspect of his life have to be tacos? Yeah. Literally in the beginning, he walks <laughs> it, he's getting back from college. They're like, let's go get tacos. The video sees Nerdrotic's guests incredulous at the fact that Jaime and his family go for tacos, and suggesting that the film having the Reyes family participate in one of their culture's more visible culinary stereotypes is offensive and reductive. But having a member of a certain culture eat a food that's common within that culture isn't actually a racism. If it's laughable that Blue Beetle has Mexican Americans eat tacos, then it's laughable whenever American characters get hot dogs at a ball game, and it's laughable whenever a French character pops a cork. It's not always wrong to use those parts of a culture which have become stereotyped. What's wrong is pre-projecting that stereotype on, or reducing the person or culture to it. And that's what we're seeing here. In the video, in which the panel makes an absolute mountain out of an incredibly short scene, in the way Ryan Kinnell refers to the film's engagement with Latino culture as taco referencing, We're just constantly making fucking taco references with the family, and obviously in that thumbnail. In Blue Beetle, the Mexican-American family enjoys tacos, but that is one small cultural characteristic among many. The uncle enjoys El Chapulín Colorado, the classic superhero parody show Mexico produced in the 70s. The father brought the family to America before working like a dog to claw together a life. Revolution and civil unrest have left scars still visible in the older generation. The grandmother lights candles, prays at the domicile's home altar. This isn't an intensive survey of modern Mexican-American family life, but it's clearly not just tacos and salsa, is it? 
As we'll see, the video looks at this tableau and more or less just pulls out the tacos, and the thumbnail compresses all this even further, representing the film by placing Jolo's face not against Carapaxes, the Scarab, Jenny Cords, but against tacos and against Family Guy's famously one-note Consuela, to whom a befuddled-looking picture of Jaime is implicitly compared, a facile comparison riffing on nasty tropes. Jaime is stereotyped, then, turned into a paper-thin cultural signifier, a signifier laughed at, but not by the film, by this thumbnail. If you think this is an uncharitable interpretation, let me contextualize it by showing you the times this channel's done that before. Those aren't great, are they? And by the way, if seeing them, if seeing the wider pattern of Nerdrotic's channel did change your mind, make all this seem less innocent and more mean-spirited, hang on to that thought. It's an important one. So that's the thumbnail. But what's wrong with the video itself? Well, how much time do you have? A full combing through of everything here isn't really what I want to do. I'm more interested in the why and the how than the what today, but let's at least establish the types of problem here. First, a couple of claims about what actually happens in the film are thrown out, which are plain wrong. Discussing the bus slicing scene from the trailers, Nerdrotic, Heel vs. Babyface, and Quarter Black Garrett say the shield's cool, but criticize the film for never having Jaime use it again. Testing its shield thing. Yeah, they wanted now, to show you things which they wouldn't use stupid. in the film. <laughs> Later on, when they, were, <laughs> when they were particularly useful, you know, that yeah. probably would have been very useful with the battle. That's my favorite yeah. trope in, in Hollywood <laughs> yeah. movies these days. Yeah. Showing shit that would be useful, oh, and then never, never using it again. It. I... Defending post. Oh, no, no. Quick, go find Rudy. Engaging threat. Engage? What you're seeing now, by the way, is Jaime using it again. Garrett also recalls this moment. And then they walk into their house and she's like, that's where Mama told us how to make salsa. When I started writing this video, I didn't remember that happening, but Blue Beetle wasn't on streaming, so I couldn't check. It's out now, though, so I had a look, and I found the moment he's talking about. But he got it a little wrong. Remember how Mom taught us salsa right there on the front porch? You were always better than me. Yeah, no, I still think you don't know how to dance salsa. <laughs> Dancing the salsa? Huh? But salsa is food, not dance. But I'm less interested in that mistake than I am in the flattening of meaning it speaks to. Let's put that moment into context. Blue Beetle's setting, Palmyra City, is a place in flux. It's two cities, really. The homes, the lived-in, real places like those we see in Jaime's ends, Palmyra Keys, and the towering, neon-lit, ultra-modern, anonymous skyscrapers that surround Cord Industries. And more and more, that first city's disappearing. After learning that his family's being forced to leave their childhood home, gentrification's a bitch, Jaime and his sister reminisce about their past. The past that's being uprooted to build more pointless towers. The past that's simultaneously no match for the looming corporate real estate takeover and is infinitely more meaningful than anything it'll produce. Do you remember your 21st birthday? Oh, I remember the first half. Oh, I can't believe we're losing this place. All this is reduced to Garrett's complaint that the Hispanic cultural trappings of Blue Beetle are shallow because it's all eating tacos and making salsa. Just just referencing Mexican food. That's all that's going on here. Good, good job, guys. But it's not just the details of the film the guests are off base on. There's also the way an unduly negative picture of the film is created by a general lack of knowledge about Blue Beetle on the part of the guests. We hear complaints like these. I saw a lot of similarities between, like, the Tony Stark tech uh, that, that, that he gave to Peter Parker. Um, the voice talking in the suit, again, reminded me of the personality inside mm -hmm. the Iron Man Friday. suit. And then and the similarity of like, oh, Spider-Man doesn't kill, Blue Beetle doesn't kill. But everybody else and, does. Uh, but the problem here is that the Jaime iteration of Blue Beetle has had the nanotech suit, the disembodied voice, since the get-go, like over 15 years back, since well before Friday or Jarvis, and well before nanotech weapons Iron Man. This isn't shameless cookie-cutter copycatting, it is instead that holy grail of comic book fandom, accuracy in adaptation. Look, maybe during the process of putting together Blue Beetle, the filmmakers were inspired by these more recent Marvel examples of Jaime-style tech, but this isn't copying them, it's copying those. You know, the comics. Lack of source material knowledge isn't a problem by itself, of course, but here? That lack of knowledge means this process of adaptation is framed as an issue. 
the whole picture isn't being given, and that's a little misleading, isn't it? The result is an unfairly negative impression of the film, which, as we'll see, is a bit of a running trend. Another trend which goes well beyond comic book knowledge is the Friday Night Tights crew being confidently inaccurate. Here, that trend extends into Latino culture. We kind of brushed up against this when talking about that thumbnail, but let's have a proper look at it here. Various elements of Blue Beetle are lampooned by the gang as playing into simplistic Latino stereotypes. The film, the film written and directed by Latinos, is the racist party here, actually. I have a lot of thoughts and feelings on Blue Beetle, most of which, yeah, was just the unnecessary, gratuitous uh, racism. They're all caricatures. The name of his truck is Taco! Does every single aspect of his life have to be tacos? George Lopez, in my opinion, had some of the most, like, cringy, racist lines in the whole movie. It's laughable that the Reyes family get tacos upon Jaime's return. Ditto with the uncle's taco van nicknaming. The family are caricatures, yada yada yada. And look, obviously I can't comment on whether or not this is an accurate reflection of US Latino culture, but I can direct you to a video made by people who are a bit more qualified in that department. The channel Latino Slant offers, as the name suggests, a Latino perspective on popular culture and discourse, and they've made a very interesting video in response to the nerd erotic daily piece we've been talking about. The family is from, uh, in Blue Beetle, is from Mexico. They are used to tacos. La abuela is making tacos all the time. And they have this joint that does proper tacos. And Jaime comes back uh, to uh, his city First thing is, let's go for tacos, because that's the comfort food. Uh, exactly like uh, my best friend comes to Ecuador, let's go for a chaula fan. It's important to note that these are not people like me, people who already had a problem with Friday Night Tights before the tac controversy. No, they actually like this podcast, and I gather Paulie from Latino Slant is friends with Nerdrotic Gary, so this is emphatically not a hit piece. It is, in my opinion, extremely generous. Yet, it's full of moments like this. It's, it's the, the name taco. of his truck is Taco! It's the What's wrong with that, bro? Actually, you... the name of my truck has a taco in it. I'm what call the... it a taco. This is another thing where you just don't understand, homie, is that we have nicknames for everything. everything. It's even in the film. He's like, it's call I'm calling the, my machine Trampoline. If yeah. you, when you create something cool, you, you name it yourself. That's what we do. That's what we do. I mean, of the of of the characters that got the most crap was George Lopez's character, uh, and I love this character. I have opinions about the uncle. Yeah, I have a ton of opinions because that's well, give the us kind one. Of guy... Give us one. Give us one. Okay, uh, that's the kind of guy that I hang out with, and he's the kind of guy that I am. There's plenty more than that in the video, so go check it out if you fancy. It's linked in the description. Suffice it to say, though, that responses like Latino slants illustrate very clearly how incorrect a lot of these comments and criticisms are, and how true the film rung for a lot of viewers nearer the subject matter. At one point in that video, Paulie calls Blue Beetles the best portrayal of a US Latino family he's seen in a while. At another, he wonders why Nerdrotic didn't invite him on to discuss the film. Hold on to that. But despite all this, that confidently inaccurate opening salvo allows the Friday Night Tights gang to proceed with the idea that Blue Beetle is racist, is itself trafficking in stereotypes. Yes, these guys... Mexicans are sneaky, dude. Come on. <laughs> ...are saying that. They go on to support that claim by leveraging this video's other main problem, piss-poor comprehension skills. That's really the best way to sum it up. For example, I'm thinking of the point Chrissy Mayer tries to make, that Blue Beetle is racist because there's a scene where a slick, professionally dressed Jaime is mistakenly directed to the delivery's entrance of a big corporate building, the implication being that the receptionist makes this blunder because of Jaime's race, i.e. because she's racist. And this wouldn't happen in reality. A receptionist wouldn't just be racist like this. Mm. And the receptionist yeah. looks at this guy with his yes. hair, you know, his hair combed, jacket Ivy and tight, jacket. And, going both, and goes, deliveries are downstairs, which would never fucking happen. You would never say that. It's just like intentionally racist. Like, oh, because this guy is tan, he and, and has no deliveries. Clearly he's here for deliveries. It was really 
kind of unbelievable the way they would sort of force the racism in. I'm not going to do the thing where I suggest that moments of bizarre, random racism like this, moments almost more absurd than offensive, do indeed happen. That yes, people in majority white spheres can sometimes get away with blatant racism for far longer than you'd expect. No, instead, I'm going to tell you that I watched Love Rosie the other day. Stay with me here. Love Rosie is a rom-com, and as rom-coms go, it's a fairly grounded one, naturalistic, realistic. And yet, at one point, as our protagonist finds herself in the hospital with an intimate health scare and Rosie is confused by the doctor's line of questioning, we get this exchange. Is it, um, front, bottom, or back? What do you think I am? Sorry. I wasn't suggesting you're a slag or anything. No doctor would say this in reality. A doctor wouldn't just be misogynistic like this, right? But that scene didn't lead any critics to label the film as sexist. So what's going on here? Well, it isn't reality. It's a film. At this moment, Love Rosie wants us to get inside the protagonist's head. She's feeling horribly self-conscious and regretting deeply the choices and events that got her to this point, so the film heightens reality a little at this moment. Has something happen? Has someone say a line that they wouldn't typically say if this situation were mirrored in the real world? Because doing so allows that idea to come across nice and clear. In that Blue Beetle scene, Jaime's swimming against the current. He's just been fired from a custodial gig for speaking out against mistreatment, for being a person instead of a glorified Roomba, but he's tried to make lemonade out of those lemons, got in contact with Jenny Cord, the person he stuck up for, he's badgered her about a non-committal job offer she'd made, and he's turned up to the HQ of a company that he'd not managed to get a job at the standard way. He's swimming against the current, that current being the near-invisible set of tricky circumstances that that had resulted from his and his family's material situation. Jaime's somewhere the current doesn't want him to be. He's in Olympus, trying to steal fire from the gods. He's not really supposed to be there. He only is because of a glitch in the corporate machinery. The millionaire's compassion. Blue Beetle doesn't have the receptionist direct Jaime to the delivery entrance because the filmmakers thought that's what always happens when sharply dressed Latinos rock up at corporate offices, and it doesn't have it happen because the filmmakers think white people are all racist and evil. Blue Beetle heightens this moment, has this receptionist say something unlikely but entirely possible to make that point again, and to have Jaime refute that point again. To look white, corporate indifference dead in the eye and say, no, that's not why I'm here. That's the point of this moment. It's not subtle, it's not hugely important even to the film, it's just a little moment making a little point, which isn't racist, and in arguing otherwise, the mayors of the world are simply revealing their own cluelessness as to the relationship between realism and cinema like this. Films aren't just about things that would happen. They're also about things that could happen. Continuing with the piss-poor comprehension theme, let's quickly touch on a few more points. At one moment, Disparu, another of Nerdrotic's guests, offers this point. What about how Blue uh... Beetle essentially killed his father? Because when he was getting shot and he was protecting the family, he, the, the robot wanted to kill them all. And that would have made they couldn't shoot anybody. But instead, yeah. he knocked them back, they got back up, caused more stress, made the father run, and then he had a heart attack running away. Did you feel like it barely needs saying, but the fact that Blue Beetle doesn't kill the people who end up causing his father's death isn't really equivalent to patricide. More to the point though, Disparu frames this as a flaw, suggests the film was wrong, either to have Jaime not kill these men, or to have that decision lead to his father's death. But isn't this just sort of the point? Jaime doesn't want to be a killer, and we'd seen him wrestle with the Scarab's disregard for human life quite a bit by this point. This moment does tell him and us that taking that high road may have consequences, may mean he can't instantly defeat everyone and save everything, but by the end of the film, Jaime's accepted this, and in the process, taught the Scarab the value of human life. It is a bitter pill to swallow that by not killing his enemies, Jaime's actions inadvertently allowed his father to die, but that bitterness isn't a flaw on the film's part. 
things can be bitter and uncomfortable. The fact that there is a price to pay for using this power the right way means it is a real choice, and the fact that by the film's end, Jaime chooses it anyway, recommits to it, has managed to impress that choice upon the alien scarab, underscores the significance and strength of Jaime's actions and his non-lethality. What about how Blue uh... Beetle essentially killed his father? Doesn't yeah. go on a superhero arc, he doesn't really learn or achieve anything. So maybe Disparo's framing of this as a flaw is off base, and maybe, just maybe, Shad is wrong in suggesting Jaime doesn't get any sort of arc or journey. You know, we turn the other cheek, we don't fight back, you know, like something like that and the family also exhibited those traits, then maybe you could understand why Jaime felt that way. Yeah. And, and like the, the very much, I don't want to hurt people, I don't want to kill, or I don't want to kill people kind of thing. But they obviously didn't give a fuck. They no. went on a yeah. murdering spree. That, that would take yeah. talent and skill and creativity to do that. It's true that other characters do kill people, even other characters on Jaime's side. True also that Jaime doesn't spend all his time saving enemy combatants from these deaths. The film isn't constructing some big central pacifist message or anything. But Jaime doesn't kill, and that's a distinction worth making. And that non-lethality, the way that non-lethality is contested by the Scarab, the way this negotiation plays into the film's subcurrent of connection with the alien that we discussed in August's Patreon video, frankly, whether or not revolutionary nana lights up some goons is beside the point. And just a few moments later, the FNT gang makes it clear that they missed that point entirely. Threat approaching. <laughs> my, my first thought when I saw that scene was, why didn't he just fly up? Why didn't the suit go, yeah. oh, we'll just hover over the bus rather than cut the fucking thing in half. It didn't fly up because it doesn't yet value human life. No, what did you do? Close protection, successful. Hey. You see that change through the film as a result of Jaime's action. Body horror. Mauler brings up the idea that, wait, what's Mauler doing here on a podcast shot through with alt-right dog whistling? She was basically <laughs> playing Hillary Clinton. She was. <laughs> <laughs> Evil, <laughs> yes. You killed my papa. And I was just like, this is so fucking boring. Get on with it. And then they actually like had the... Um, I think it's fair no, the reference. vaccine killed your dad. <laughs> <laughs> What's Mola doing on a podcast that previously hosted the founder of the Proud Boys? I thought he was totally uh, neutral and objective, in no way part of that pipeline. Wait, what's that? He's a semi-regular guest here? And just had plenty of these guys on his podcast, often repeatedly? Well, that can't be right. Mauler brings up the idea of tonal whiplash. When he fucks around with it after being told not to, and he starts transforming with the suit, that was with like the tone for the film just completely fucked me because I was watching him screaming in agony. In like agony. This, yeah. It looks like it's melting and he's just uh, crippled himself onto the ceiling. The whole of the family are like, oh, no, 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 no. After a little general chuntering. He flies out of the ceiling and then they're repairing the table. They don't know where he is. Well, and they're they just like, oh, let's uh, fix our table because that's more important. No, you're right, Garrett. They should have flown after him. Brian Kinnell agrees with him too. Fuller's Help 100% us. on though because it is like, it shifts to this almost like horror, horrific feeling of this, and it's just George Lopez high pitched screaming, and it's like yeah. slapstick comedy bullshit. And it's like, yeah. it does not match the tone at all. The problem here is that this sudden darker vibe is jarringly deflated by the slapstick and by Uncle Rudy's screeching. And it isn't clear whether the boys think this is a problem because the scene should have been darker, or simply because tonal whiplash is bad, but either way, they don't seem to see that those injections of comedy are what keep the tone from totally shifting. <laughs> If you've seen Captain Midnight's Blue Beetle video, you'll know what I'm referring to. He talks about it in a little more depth, but to summarize, those editing choices, those moments of comedy, are the very things preventing Tonal Whiplash, allowing Blue Beetle to dip its toes into another style besides campy superhero flick without having to fully commit, in a way that keeps that light tone within reach. It's quite clear that this sequence is precisely as dark as it's meant to be. That Blue Beetle doesn't want to go full Cronenberg, but does want to get a little uncomfortable, just for a moment, because, well, there is something a little uncomfortable about this premise, about alien thing fuses to human. That places the film, and this moment specifically, in a sort of off-kilter position, between one clearly defined tone and another. But there's really no reason to consider the resulting being in uncertainty a flaw, rather than a deliberate choice. 
If the tone or tones of the sequence didn't work for you, that's one thing. But the framing of the balance that emerges as accidentally blurry, the result of lazily throwing slapstick where it doesn't belong, gives us another moment where this discussion seems to avoid engaging with the film on its own terms. And it's very odd that the FNT gang is criticizing Blue Beetle for being formulaic one minute. If you've seen a, a superhero movie before, then there's no spoilers. They they just no. take yeah, pieces of other superhero movies. If you've movies, seen so. Shaquille O'Neal in, in Steel, Steel, you've seen <laughs> yeah. this. And then showing such discomfort at anything that pushes beyond clear-cut formulas the next. We could keep going, there's no shortage of this sort of thing on display, but yeah, alongside the aforementioned sense of confident inaccuracy, that's the other pillar of the video, poor comprehension. Whether that be expressed in Ryan and Mauler's arguments that the film's chosen tone doesn't match the film's tone, in the Jaime lethality confusion, or in Mare's misunderstanding of basic filmmaking conventions and subsequent racist labelling. The result is a torrent of negativity, which is, as we've seen, rarely reflective of Blue Beetle, the presence of which is nominally justified by that opening salvo of inaccurate characterizations. A small handful of well-founded criticisms, like sure, Susan Sarandon isn't doing much here, are joined by an avalanche of unfounded ones to build an extended, disparaging segment upon those initial assumptions of progressive racism, which leaves the inattentive viewer with the impression that Blue Beetle is riddled with objective flaws, and that these flaws extend naturally from ideological flaws, from filmmakers' intent on reducing Latinos to their cultural stereotypes in the name of wokeness and representation, and on unfairly demonizing the whites. Again, the film of course does neither of those things, but this is the impression Nerdrotic's clipped, tightly edited FNT compilation video gives, and intentionally so. Again, a few times throughout that Latino slant video I mentioned earlier, host Pauli expresses confusion at the fact Nerdrotic didn't get him on the panel. After all, he'd surely have been able to speak a good deal more accurately to the fidelity of Blue Beetle's Latino trappings. I'm not confused though, having Paulion would have made their jobs harder. And I don't know if we want to put up spoilers, but I can share them because they're pretty spoilers? Down hilarious. Nobody cares! <laughs> <I can. laughs> Nobody uh, cares! If this is your first time on Nerdrotic Daily, or seeing the Friday Night Tights goobers, you might think they're just getting it twisted over nitpicks and inaccurate observations, but if not, you'll likely recognize the pattern, subjecting the bad labeled, the already woke spotted things to waves of intense scrutiny, disdain, and incredulity reserved for them. Oh, they're, they're brown, so they're perpetual victims. They just want to push us out of our neighborhood. That's not critique, that's just mockery and contempt. Nedrotic and his peons take for granted that the work is bad and work out their justifications after. Justifications which often don't hold up to any scrutiny. Consider the following example. And then he went, she went, you can create anything. And went, oh, oh, let's make one sword out of the <laughs> oh, Wait, 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 wait. It was a bigger sword. It was like a sword. It was Cloud's sword, right? It was the Buster sword. Yeah, yeah. yeah it looked like a Buster sword. And like, and that, I don't mind like somebody like that who's like, they didn't show him ever playing video games or anything. That's no. one of the problems, right? Yeah. Like if they had shown yeah, that he was like a gamer or whatever. controller on yeah. his side table. In this case, a guest made an already tenuous nitpick, that making a big sword only makes sense if you're a gamer, and since the film didn't show Jaime to be a gamer, this is a flaw, only for another guest to realize that the nitpick isn't just tenuous, but obviously wrong, and be forced to set the record straight. You know you've beefed it when fucking pronouns guy has to correct you. Kinnell then apologizes, recants his criticism, and praises the film for setting that detail up. I'm kidding, obviously. Instead, this happens. It's like a gamer controller or whatever. on yeah. his side table. Yeah, exactly. Right, right next to the salsa. That's all you <laughs> need. <laughs> or consider this moment. We learn out of absolutely nowhere that he's this technical genius. Like mm. we're supposed to just be like, yeah. oh, of course, of course he's a tech genius. Like isn't every Hispanic uncle a tech genius? Obviously it ought to go without saying that the homegrown tech whiz is a staple superhero trope, but Rudy's a mechanic, that's his job. That justifies his DIY inventor status to a greater degree than many more well-known examples. So I'll tell you what, if anyone can find me an existing clip of Mare making the same complaint about Peter Parker, a non-mechanic who at less than half Rudy's age invented his web fluid and web shooters, I'll become a top level member of Nerdrotic's YouTube membership program. 
But Mez allowed to make this point, with no pushback in a call full of professed comic nerds. So the fact that these critiques are weak doesn't matter. It's not the complaints that are important, it's the complaining. It was very mid, if anything. Boo. Uh, boo. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered if Blue Beetle had been a wholly different film, if these complaints, the supposed anti-white racist microaggressions, the unreasonably intelligent inventor, the taco referencing hadn't been present. They'd just have made other ones, because the gleefully dismissive energy which animates this panel, which animates this whole video, isn't a result of the film's quality. It's a result of the negative stance they default to for any franchise property that's had their idea of problematic wokeness projected onto it. And if you're not sure what I'm referring to there, link to now is a video all about that process of projection. It's about now, 30-ish minutes in, that given this video's title, you may well be wondering, where's Nerdrotic in all this? The guy himself, Gary. Despite the fact that this was uploaded to one of his channels, and is flush with his branding, we've only talked very briefly about the things he actually says in this video. But it is his video. This second channel is very clearly an arm of the Nerdrotic brand. If this video is a torrent of negativity, he's the one turning the tap. It's easy to forget, since he's rarely the most vocal, but Friday Night Tights is his podcast. He assembles the panels and directs the flow of conversation. He's the Nick Fury of jabronis, nitpickers, and anti-fans. Gary has a lot of your more standard anti-fan content on his main channel, which is significant. A lot of his selectively reported rating slash box office videos, in addition to being stinky little nuggets of bigoted doo-doo by themselves, serve to set the tenor of wider chud reports on the same topics, but to limit critiques of Nerdrotic solely to his main channel content is to miss an important bigger picture. Nerdrotic's impact on this little corner of YouTube isn't simply in the videos he puts out. It is in those, but it's also in these streams, and in the clipped highlights such as these, and not always in ways which are immediately apparent. Sure, the streams make for low-effort standalone content tasks, farming super chats, but these podcasts also double as brainstorming slash briefing sessions. After all, if you try hard enough, you can poke holes, dig out foundations for reactionary rants disguised as readings in anything yourself. But you don't even need to try if you get a half dozen professional pedants in a Zoom call to do it for you. With Friday Night Tights, Nerdrotic can at once outsource the brainstorm and see to it that the wider Nerdrotic family of chuds is fully equipped with the resulting talking points to dust off and use whenever. Nerdrotic's influence goes beyond either channel, goes beyond his streams even, and suffuses the channels and web presences of his guests. That influence ripples out to other people, other channels, other podcasts, spreading far enough that it begins to take on an organic semblance even, but it isn't. They get their topics and talking points from each other, they get their statistics from the same poisoned wells, and they work together to build mutually supportive structures of outrage, to unleash and direct torrent after torrent of targeted negativity, and to maintain the narratives that legitimize that targeting process. Thing woke, woke bad, thing bad, here's why. And by the time you contest the why, they've already moved on, already stacked more ideological Jenga atop that position. That pattern is wider than Nerdrotic's network. The web it's produced is a multi-centered one, but in Nerdrotic, on his channels, in these streams, and in those adjacent web presences, it's perhaps more blatant than anywhere else. That is, if you know what you're looking for. If you don't, if you take these guys at their word, consume the misinformation, the notions of objective flaws resulting from either imbecilic writers only bothered about getting paid by woke Disney, or just from degenerate moral failings, if you see the similarity in content strategy, not as the result of coordination, but as organic, various free thinkers just happening to arrive at the same obvious conclusions, you start getting angry, start getting suggested little else by the algorithm algorithm, and the cycle begins. You stop getting excited by the art at the center of all this and start dreading it. The pleasure you got from engaging with it once upon a time is replaced by a sort of astroturfed in catharsis as you revel in watching the guys who sold you this lie appear to prove it time and time again. It feels good to get angry about this. 
easy, emotionally engaging answers go down a lot smoother than complex ones. That's how the audience is captured. That's how it grows. In comments, on social media sites, these anti-fans and their viewers feed the flames. Any dissent is viewed as cancel culture gone mad, feeds the persecution complex, kicks up the fear. All the while, hanging out in these circles, your tolerance for casual racism or transphobia or whatever else is growing. Because what is the big deal, really? They're just joking. If you're offended, you're the problem. God, why is everyone such a snowflake these days? My life's not perfect, I've got my problems, but society doesn't let me be down about them because I'm straight or white or a guy or, God forbid, all of the above. And all those movies, games, TV I used to like, they all hate me for that. Apparently, I, I saw it on YouTube. You know, maybe there should be more people like me on screen. Maybe we really are under attack. Man, it seems like there's only a few sensible people left. People who get this. Oh boy, one of them's uploaded a new video. And so, as one, they swarm to YouTube every time another morsel of cathartic hate gets released, engage with the video, boosting it further still, and throng the comment section. Or, well, that's how it normally goes, because in a twist for the ages, if you scroll down from that video and look to the comments, you won't see swathes of 14-year-olds agreeing with the gang. You'll see a whole host of comments clapping back. This video went viral, and went viral outside of its target demographic. Responses across the internet, though most notably on TikTok, amassed millions of views. Internet users from within and without the Latino and comic book communities chimed in to point out the various inaccuracies and blatantly offensive angles of this video and thumbnail, exposing plenty of onlookers to Nerd Rotic and the gang for the first time. Onlookers so blissfully naive that the expected Nerd Rotic apology became recognized and auto-suggested as a search term. Ripples from this outcry did indeed make it back to YouTube. A few less notable anti-woke channels saw opportunity in the drama and rushed in to play defense. Nerdrotic is mocking being cancelled after a TikToker decided that they would stir up a firestorm online by focusing on Nerdrotic's Blue Beetle video. Jesus Christ, how many of these guys are there? No apology came, of course. Instead, Nerdrotic doubled down. He since used Let's Taco Bout as a title template a few more times on unrelated topics, either in an attempt to mine the controversy for all it's worth, or perhaps to try and demonstrate there's nothing intrinsically offensive about taco-themed punnery, which is true, and therefore that he did nothing wrong, which is not, and obviously does not follow from the previous point. But those among you who are already somewhat familiar with Nerdrotic and Friends might be a little confused. Sure, there's plenty of ignorance and insensitivity on display here. Like We're tough people! That's what we do. Oh, yeah. Mexicans are sneaky, dude. Come on. Because of <laughs> Damn. There's a good few brazen alt-right conspiratorial interjections. Playing Hillary Clinton. She was. <laughs> <laughs> Evil? Yes. No, the vaccine killed your dad. Half the panel's just acting offended by the film's values, responding to it with incredulity and mockery more so than critique or review, and even the few moments of actual discussion are suffused with conservative, return to tradition aesthetics. I think that was a great aspect of this, one of the few great aspects of the movie, that it was really centered on family. I like the fact that there was a love interest, and it wasn't like uh, she was shutting him down or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I like that. That's kind of back to traditional some storytelling that we don't fucking get. Also, you know, fat phobia to round out that list. I'm like, oh, you're, oh, we're brown. Maybe, we're maybe stop like, feeding the daughter. Maybe yeah. stop feeding her. <laughs> but so what, right? None of that is remotely new here. That's, that's what they do. The inaccuracies, the poor media comprehension, all of those problems we spent so long discussing are not remotely unique to this specific Nerdrotic Daily upload. Why the response, the callouts, the woefully naive expectations of a Nerdrotic apology? Well, there's only really two things that stand out between this Nerdrotic video and all the other ones. One, the thumbnail is a little more overt, a little more overly risque than normal, and two, perhaps as a result, People outside the usual nerdrotic geeks and gamers Friday Night Tights circle took notice of it. And that's good. It's always good for more people to become aware of the idiocy of those leading this anti-woke grift, but it's not all good. This isn't nearly as big a dub as it seems. 
The thing to understand is that the backlash is not from the fans of Nerd Roderick, of his podcast, or any of those guests. This isn't the end of that boiling frog syndrome. This isn't a regular audience who have seen their faves go a bridge too far and have realized there's a problem here. The TikToks, the backlash, those top comments are from a wholly external demographic. Nothing's changed with Nerdrotic's fans, and so nothing's changed on the channel. There's something of an inherent weakness to external backlash like this, then. People who are unfamiliar or less familiar with Nerdrotic et al seeing and critiquing a video like this are always going to focus on the specifics of these videos, the critiques and comments that jump out as wrong or offensive, rather than those trends and patterns behind those specifics. Because, well, if they're not familiar with the MO, if they don't have that context, the comments, the thumbnail, and everything else seem like random, discrete instances of ignorance, bigotry, and poor criticism. And if someone's ignorant, you can correct them. If the nitpickers can be proven wrong, maybe they'll know for next time. And if the grounds of those generalizing assumptions can be debunked, maybe those assumptions will stop. But as we've seen, the details, the specifics, aren't the point. They're the excuse. Callouts are satisfying, but they don't really move the needle. The root of the problem here has nothing to do with tacos, nothing to do with Blue Beetle, even. The problem is the pattern of selective scrutiny that determined well before that stream was ever planned that Blue Beetle would be subjected to that torrent of negativity, and that the torrent's constituent nitpicks and criticisms would necessarily be molded into one more reactionary warhead for the culture war. Culture war is good. We're in the fucking culture war, whether we like it or not. Yes. We are in it. And it's going to last a while, and it was never going to be fucking easy. Blue Beetle, the taco bouting of Blue Beetle, these are but single points in that pattern. And that pattern is what needs to be called out, plastered across TikTok, disseminated. The fact that this isn't about ignorance or accidental insensitivity, the hate isn't organic. They didn't slam Blue Beetle and the wokeness behind it because of these inaccurate complaints and cultural mischaracterizations. They're slamming the film, making those complaints, and mischaracterizing this culture because they don't like that wokeness, and they've built a market of Pavlovian bigots who don't like wokeness either. Whatever it is, don't ask me to define it. I, I can, I promise, I, I just don't want to. Everything else follows, and it will follow again and again, because content like this is easy to make and addictive to consume. It's not about bad complaints, or bad videos, or bad thumbnails even. These are just the tells. It's about bad actors, acting in bad patterns and bad faith, exploiting bad systems to create bad pipelines and spread bad politics. Nerdrotic and Friday Night Tights are at the center of all that. Calling this out? That's winning. Victory is enough people seeing that pattern that they don't take the bait, that they don't fall down that pipeline, that doing this stops being so financially rewarding, and that this online wing of the war against wokeness stops being so effective a tool at laundering right-wing sentiments to people who aren't equipped to notice what they're watching is effectively highly lucrative, self-sustaining propaganda. The subtle but ever-present racism is something I couldn't ignore. None of this is to say that in the course of this, no good criticisms will be made, or that no bad movie will be slammed. It's to say, that isn't the reason these videos exist. And none of this is to say that all of Nerdrotic's guests and collaborators, regular or occasional, are in on it too. It's to say that they don't need to be in on it to be useful to it, because every head in the call means more complaints, valid or otherwise, added to the torrent, means more borrowed legitimacy, means it's harder and harder for people without this frame of reference to separate content like this from organic critique, and that it's more and more tedious and, I might add, backlash-inducing for people in the know to try and help out. Callouts are satisfying, but they don't move the needle. Getting informed? helping each other see past the grift, well, that just might. And I should add at this point that this is starting to happen a bit. It's about time. It's about fucking time the general public recognized how racist this nigga really is, bro. It, it, it's about fucking time. Like, I swear to God, every time this nigga talks about Miles Morales, you can hear the ghost of Bull Connor speaking through this nigga. But responses like that are certainly the exception rather than the rule, for now at least. Don't view this video as a takedown attempt, view it as a case study. In what the Nerdrotic brand does, how it's responded to, how those responses are prompted, and what their limitations might be. 
That's it. I'm not attempting a gotcha here. Again, the stuff in this Blue Beetle video is mild for these guys. In nerdrotic terms, nothing about this whole situation is singularly awful. It's just another piece in their little puzzle. Another annoying little shape that takes on new meaning when you plug it into the pattern. So please, plug it in. A couple of things, just before we end. First, even though I get the impression our opinions differ on a few things, if you have seen Blue Beetle, I'd really recommend watching that Latino slant video, even if you couldn't care less about Nerdrotic or Friday Night Tights. If you're not from a Hispanic background, it adds a whole new layer to the film, really brings a lot of small details to life. Second, I will grant it's possible, theoretically, that some of the problems I honed in on, in terms of inaccuracies and the like, are corrected or expanded upon in the original stream this video was edited down from, but that doesn't actually matter, and I'll tell you why. What was included, what was omitted in this edit, is as much and as relevant a choice as what was said and what wasn't. If there was nuance that was cut for the edit, for the bite-sized whinge pellet, that's a bad thing. And the last thing I'll say is that if you think what I do on this channel is worth supporting, the best thing you can do to help is to join up at any tier on Patreon or YouTube, naturally in exchange for a bunch of cool perks. And if you're not in a position to do that, likes, comments, and shares all go a long way too. Finally, huge thanks as always to everyone supporting the channel at present, the whole gang on screen now, especially Daniel Goldhorn, Karen Kuhlman, Magath, Ryan Emily, Something Something Capitalism Bad, Thomas R, and Weirdy Beardy. Peace.